what is the reason that so many Anthony Joshua fans are absolutely desperate to see him step back in the ring and have this immediate rematch with Andy Ruiz? What's the reason for it? Why the rush? Why the desperation to see the rematch now? It's a rhetorical question, of course. The reason that so many AJ fans are desperate for him to rematch Ruiz is because of pride. And I'm not talking about AJ's pride. I'm talking about their pride, the fans. Their pride has been hurt. Some of them are proud British boxing fans. And now they've got all these Americans saying, ha ha, you're a top guy got taken out by an American. You British fighters are over, over there, are all bums. So these British boxing fans, a lot of them, their pride is hurt by that. So they want to see AJ get right back in the ring with Ruiz and right that wrong so they can start feeling like proud British boxing fans again. Other people are Matchroom fans and they want to see Matchroom take down PBC. So now AJ's lost to a PBC guy. They want to see him go right back in there because they're tired of all this ridicule from the PBC fans. They want to see AJ go right back in there, right the wrong so they can start feeling like proud matchroom fans again. And some people are just general AJ fans. They might not necessarily be big matchroom fans or big, you know, patriots when it comes to being British, but for whatever reason, they're just big AJ fans. And again, they feel like their pride is hurt. Since AJ lost to Ruiz, they've been getting trolled online by Wilder fans and Fury fans and what have you. They want to see AJ go right back in there, beat Ruiz in the rematch so they can start feeling proud to be AJ fans again. This is what it's all about. It's just about pride. It's not about what's best for Anthony Joshua in terms of his development as a fighter or his rehabilitation as a fighter. It's not about that for them. It's just about their pride. That's why they're desperate to see him get back in the ring with Ruiz immediately. But as the old saying goes, pride comes before a fall. <laughs> right? Remember that. Pride comes before a fall. Sometimes you have to put your pride aside. Take a step back. Take a deep breath. Think about things calmly and logically and reassess. AJ is set for life. He's made more money than all the top heavyweights combined. He's already ticked the box of having generational wealth. He's already ticked the box of being a unified champion with several defenses. What's the desperation to want to see him go back in with Ruiz again immediately? What for? Why, why, why does he need to do that? For what exactly? Oh, they might freeze him out. Yeah, they'll freeze him out at the absolute most for two years. Tops. And during that time, he can be rehabilitating. Working on his game. Picking the perfect opponents to work on specific strategies and specific techniques. That's a luxury that he doesn't have if he regains his titles. He's going to have mandatories forced upon him and he's only going to have a pool of, what, 10 fighters or so to pick from. And some of them won't be, even be available when it comes to voluntary defenses. So it's all about pride. And for those who are hearkening back to the old days in you know the 20s and 30s when a loss didn't mean nothing, You'd rematch the guy a few months later and that was a, a regular thing. Well, boxing management has moved on and evolved since then. You see, it was commonplace back in the old days to throw a fighter in the deep end very early in his career. And so what would happen is you would end up with damaged fighters by the end of their career because you're so reckless and gung-ho about throwing them back in and throwing them back in, even after they've taken a loss, even when they may not have recovered psychologically or physically from losses, you're throwing them straight back in. Sometimes for the fighters, they had to go straight back in because they got to put food on the table. If certain fighters had been managed the right way back then, back in the old days, 
we would have seen certain fighters who didn't become great go on to become great, potentially, if they'd been managed the right way. But certain fighters were damaged during their career. Because they were stepped up too quick. They were thrown back in the deep end too soon. They weren't given enough time to recover from losses psychologically or physically and ended up ruined. Whereas if they'd been brought along the right way, they might have actually blossomed and turned out to be something great. I remember there were stories, this is slightly different, but there were stories way back in the days of the sparring sessions in the Kronk gym under Manny Stewart. And it is said that some of them were so brutal that certain fighters were ruined in that gym. Certain fighters who had great potential were never the same after certain sparring wars. And, you know, having a hard spar is all well and good, but you can't be hard sparring all the time. Yeah, most fighters, you don't need to be going hell for leather in every sparring session. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Tunde Ajayi when it comes to his PR, if you want to call it that. But with regards to his views on sparring, I don't necessarily 100% agree, but I can see where he's coming from. Because Tunde Ajayi is a trainer who doesn't believe in real hard sparring all the time. You know, gym wars and all that kind of thing. Tunde doesn't believe in that. And what I do definitely think that you need some hard sparring, you need to mix it up and have plenty of lighter sessions in there, plenty of technical sessions in there. Yeah, it's not just about developing the fighter's toughness. You have to develop their technique. You have to develop their confidence. You have to be building them up psychologically. Yeah, that's why I say boxing management and I'm talking about the good managers and good promoters today, it's more sophisticated than it was back in the 20s and 30s when you're just throwing the fighters back in again and again. Oh, he lost one. He got knocked out in one round. Let's throw him back in again against the puncher <laughs> in the next fight. You know, that kind of thing. I'm not saying that everybody was doing that back then, but that was fairly commonplace. That kind of thing was going on. That's how exploitative it was back then of fighters. You know, And it still goes on today, but when you're dealing with the most talented fighters, the management of them tends to be a bit more sophisticated than that. Yeah? So, for me, I want to see Anthony Joshua become the best fighter he can possibly be. That is the motivation for me saying he shouldn't take the Ruiz rematch right now. But for those who are desperate to see him go straight back in, for them it's all about pride. Their matchroom pride, their British pride, their AJ fan pride, whatever it is, it's all about pride. It's all emotion. It's not taking a step back and thinking, okay, is this actually what's best for his development? Because he was rushed to the title in the first place. I made, you know, I, I, I was responding to a post in my Facebook boxing group a few minutes ago. Somebody asked me, uh, to comment on the fact that prior to AJ's fight against Charles Martin, I was a bit, you know, wary of him stepping up to championship level at the time. Not because I didn't think he could beat Charles Martin, but because once you're at world championship level, you can't go backwards. And then you're now you're in the deep end with the Wolves. And AJ obviously has done fantastically well to win the fights that he's won, you know, since becoming champion. But ultimately, the flaws, which he never managed to address prior to winning the world title because there wasn't enough of a development phase, the flaws were ultimately exposed and not just by Andy Ruiz either. Because me and many other people were talking about the vulnerabilities that he showed in the Klitschko fight, the vulnerability that he showed in the Dylan White fight, the vulnerability that he showed in the Takam fight, the vulnerability that he showed in the Povetkin fight. Me and many others were pointing these things out. But because those are tough opponents, as I mentioned in a previous video, you don't often get the time 
to develop yourself to be able to deal with these kind of opponents. It's just a sink or swim battle for survival in the ring. And you can't have that every time you step in there or most of the time you step in there. You need to be able to tailor your learning experience. So let's say you're somebody who has issues with pressure fighters. Okay, we'll step you down from world title level. We'll bring in a pressure fighter who is tough, who's going to take you rounds, but he's not really a puncher. And, and now I want you to go out there and implement what you've been practicing in the gym on this fighter. If you manage to do it to my satisfaction in this fight, then we'll step you up to a pressure fighter who's a bit better than this guy, a bit more dangerous. If you don't do it to my satisfaction in this fight, then we'll find somebody else similar and we'll try that again. We'll keep working in the gym. And once I see the improvements that I want to see, then we'll step you up to a better pressure fighter, you know, as your next opponent. This is the method <laughs> of any uh, trainer, manager, promoter who's worth their salt. This is what they're looking for. Uh, Eddie Hearn has said on many occasions that AJ wasn't ready for the step up. Every time they've stepped him up, he wasn't ready, but they did it anyway, and somehow he found a way to win. And that's admirable. That's, that shows tremendous quality. I, I've been saying for years, even as an amateur, AJ was thrown in at the deep end. When he, when he fought in Azerbaijan, he was thrown in at the deep end with amateurs who are way more experienced than him. So it's obviously a massive credit to AJ that you know, somebody who hasn't developed his skill set and isn't as rounded fighter as many other uh, world level heavyweights are, is a massive credit to him that he's been able to succeed, you know, have so much success despite his shortcomings, despite his rawness. Yeah? So let's not get it twisted here. AJ is a fantastic talent. But there's a lot of development and a lot of learning that he needs to catch up on in my view. And the best way to do that, again, in my view, is for him to take a step down from championship level. Them belts ain't going to stay in PBC forever. Just like George Foreman said, it's only a matter of time before the belts get fractured again and they go here, there, and everywhere. I mentioned in the last video, you got Joe Joyce, that's somebody I forgot to mention. Joe Joyce is coming up in the game. Nathan Gorman, Daniel Dubois, Hergovic. You got Tyson Fury out there. You got Dylan White out there. You got Joseph Parker out there. You got Alexander Usyk out there. You got Michael Hunter out there. You got Jarrell Miller out there. You got Luis, I mean, well, let me not say Luis Ortiz because he's a PVC guy, but you get the point I'm making. There is a whole heap of heavyweights out there who are not with PBC. And people are so scared about PBC monopolizing the belts. It's not going to happen. <laughs> There's too many talented fighters outside of PBC for that to happen. Too many fighters who have got big fan bases outside of PBC for that to happen. And that's significant because if you've got a fan base, that means you can generate money. And if you're generating money, you're going to attract the interest of the sanctioning bodies who are going to want you to fight for their belt. So people at the moment are motivated by fear. Yeah, fear. Fear that their pride is going to continue to be hurt if AJ don't get straight back in there and beat Ruiz in a rematch immediately. That's what they're fearful of. But I'm not motivated by fear. I'm not motivated by pride. I'm motivated by what is best for every fighter. And it's not just AJ. I'm interested in seeing every single fighter out there make the most of their physical potential. Wilder, Fury, Dylan White, everybody. That's why I talk about these things in my videos. And I emphasize, oh, well, he's, he's not doing this right or he's not doing that right or he could do this better or he could do that better. 
I'm looking at specific things that the fighters are doing and not doing and saying, okay, you can, you're proving this and approving. even when they're winning. Yeah, because I'm looking at fighters and saying, okay, I think I, I can see what potential he has. If he was taught to do this, he could fulfill his potential. Or if he was taught to do that, or if he was brought along this way, you know? I mean, people talk about Manny Stewart if he was alive today, RIP, what he could do with Anthony Joshua. I've also talked about what Manny Stewart could do with Deontay Wilder because, to be honest, Manny Stewart might even prefer to train Deontay Wilder over Anthony Joshua because Manny Stewart loves pure punches. <laughs> he loves pure punches. He's known for, you know, to newer boxing fans for training people like Lennox Lewis and Vladimir Klitschko. And those were two fighters who were inherently or, or innately cautious, particularly Vladimir. Lewis was a, a bit more willing to get stuck in than Vladimir. But at the time when Lewis was fighting, he was often criticized for being too cautious in fights. Yeah. And uh, Manny Stewart got on Lewis's case in several fights for being too cautious or too cautious for his liking. But with somebody like Deontay Wilder, he has a puncher's mentality. You don't have to get on his case to try and finish a guy. He's trying to finish everybody. <laughs> Even if it's late in the fight, if he finds an opportunity to land a big shot, he's going to go for the finish. And that's what Manny Stewart loved in fighters. You know, one, I remember Manny Stewart many years ago uh, when Frank Bruno beat a guy called Rodolfo Marin. And it was, I think, the week after a Prince Nassim fight. It might have been the week. Was it on the undercard of Ben McClellan? I can't remember, but it was around that time frame. And I remember Manny Stewart talking about Rodolfo Marin and saying that that guy wouldn't even be qualified to do shadow boxing in our gymnasium in the Kronk. And he went on to say that one of the reasons that in the past, he never liked to train heavyweights is because most of them don't have any heart. That's what Manny Stewart said. That in his experience, most heavyweights don't have no heart. He wants to see guys who have a killer instinct that go for it. You know, the Tommy Hearns kind of attitude. Deontay Wilder has that. <laughs> so I think Manny Stewart would have loved to train Deontay Wilder. I'm not saying he wouldn't have liked, liked to train the AJ too. He would have done, but I think he really would have enjoyed the viciousness, even the hot-headedness of Deontay Wilder, you know? And I've often criticized the things that Wilder says and the decisions that he makes, but in terms of Deontay Wilder, the fighter, and what he can do in the ring, go back and look at my history. Look at my post-fight videos. Look at my preview videos for Deontay Wilder fights and show me the video where I was making out as though Deontay Wilder was rubbish. Quite the opposite. I've spoken highly of Deontay Wilder, the fighter, pretty much since the very beginning, since I first started making videos about him donkeys years ago. <laughs> you know, I think I first started making videos about Deontay Wilder, maybe when he was about 20 and 0, 25 and 0, because obviously he fought a bunch of like hillbilly cab drivers and, you know, God knows what, uh, forklift operators <laughs> and stuff like that for his first 20, 25 fights. But once he started fighting, you know, people like Lykovic and, uh, names I actually recognized, that's when I started making videos about him. And I was complimentary from the beginning. I was like, well, this guy's got some serious power there. While everybody else, or let me not say everybody else, most other people were honing in on all the things he did wrong. I was mostly focusing on the things he did right. Not just the punching power, the speed, and his ability to be able to land that right hand consistently, because that's a skill. There are plenty of fighters out there with big right hands who can't land them as consistently as Wilder can. That's a skill. But while so many people were obsessed with, oh, his balance is terrible and he's jumping off the canvas when he throws part, all this kind of stuff people were obsessing over, I was saying, hey, look, don't let his flaws blind you to the fact that he has tremendous strengths. You know, 
So anyway, without getting sidetracked too much, point being, for me, it's all about seeing every fighter fulfill their potential. That's what it's about. And it's, it's my opinion at the end of the day in terms of how I think it's best for them to go about that. In some cases, I'll say, oh, this guy needs to change trainer or this guy needs to fight these kind of opponents or this guy needs to be moved a bit slower or this guy needs to be moved a bit quicker. This guy needs tougher sparring. This guy needs to ease up in sparring. You know, it's all just my opinion. But the motive, the motivation is to see every fighter become the best version of themselves in the ring. That's all. It's not about pride. It's not about ego. It's not about... Uh, Matchroom versus the US. It's not out of fear. It's none of that. It's actually out of the love of the art. And, and me in general, as a, as a human being in my day-to-day -day life, I always encourage people to try and find whatever their talent is and make the most of that talent. Anybody who knows me in real life will tell you that. In fact, I get frustrated in my real, you know, in real life with people who don't make the most of their talent. That's just, you know, a character trait that I have. I could get obsessive about people making the most of their ability, irrespective of what that ability is. And I can tell you that my younger brother used to box and he was more talented than me. So I was always on his case, like, you need to do this boxing thing. <laughs> you need to take this as far as it can go. You know, because smaller than me, uh, several weight divisions, you know, lighter than me. I'm a heavyweight. He was, what was he like? Light middleweight, something like that. Um, but tremendously talented. But he didn't have the desire to pursue boxing seriously for whatever reason. He had other interests in life and boxing to him was a little bit of a hobby but he was never, his heart was never really in it. And that just frustrated the hell out of me because I felt like this guy has got so much talent, but yet he's not, you know, going to fulfill that potential. So that's just a, a, a thing I have in general. You know, I've, I've come across people who are great artists and they're working dead end nine to five jobs. And I go to their house and they've got flipping Van Gogh, you know, Van Gogh level paintings on there. <laughs> in their private, you know, collection or whatever of their own pay. And I'm like, what the hell are you do work, doing work in a nine to five when you can paint like this or draw like this? What's wrong with you? So that's just what I'm about. I, I, I like to see people make the most of their ability. Yeah? It frustrates me when they don't. <laughs> and, and as it, uh, you know, relates to boxing, I want to be entertained. That's ultimately my motivation. I want to be entertained. So the fighters who are giving me the most entertainment, the fighters who are stepping up to the mark when they're world champions and taking on all comers, I'm going to give that guy the most amount of props. Not because of who he is, but because of what he's doing. See, a lot of people got it twisted when AJ was champion and they were thinking, oh, Hatman's just a big AJ fan and it's all biased. See, these people had it completely twisted from the beginning. All I was doing was giving AJ credit for what he was doing. He was going out there and he's fighting top guys, getting wins, and he'd done it in a far shorter space of time than Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder did in their respective careers. So why am I not giving this guy credit? I have to give him credit for what he's doing. And not only is he beating all these top opponents, but he's also doing it in an exciting fashion for the most part. So extra credit, because I want to be entertained. A lot of people just can't get their head around this because they project their own mentality onto me because they go around with these biases and they have their hot favorites and, you know, certain fighters who in their eyes can walk on water and do no wrong. And so when they hear me giving AJ praise and criticizing Wilder and criticizing Fury, oh, well, he must be an AJ fan. No, no, I'm a boxing fan. I give credit where it's due. And AJ deserved a massive amount of credit for what he was doing during his championship reign and even before that. If you, ca if you can't give him credit for what he was doing, you're biased. It ain't me that's biased. It's me being fair, <laughs> giving the man the credit that he's due. 
Look at the names on his record through 23 fights. You can't give that man credit. Some joke thing. Yeah? And most of my criticisms of Wilder and Fury have been the stuff they say. Occasionally their opponents, but more so the stuff they've been saying and the moves they've been making outside the ring rather than what they've been doing inside the ring. You look at the things I've said about Wilder inside the ring. Or Fury for that matter. Inside the ring, I'm mostly complimentary of the pair of them. <laughs> it's just the stuff they say outside the ring. AJ is somebody who he, he tolls that PC line and therefore doesn't really give me much to criticize by way of things that he says. Because he doesn't really say much. And when he does open his mouth and say something, it's usually very measured and conservative. Whereas the other two, Wilder and Fury, are usually coming out of their mouth with all kind of trash talk and, <laughs> you know, a lot of nonsense. So people, again, getting it twisted, thinking because I'm criticizing what they're saying, rightly so, because they're contradicting themselves and, you know, coming out with a lot of nonsense. Well, that means I must hate them. No, it doesn't mean I hate them. Deontay Wilder has been one of my favorite fighters to watch for years. <laughs> I mean, I love watching Deontay Wilder fight. That's remained consistent throughout. I mean, even when he knocked out Brazil recently, listen how excited I was in a post-fight video. And I love watching Wilder fight. That guy gives me entertainment. <laughs> it's like Anthony Yard once said, Wilder brings the roads into the ring. <laughs> That's what he does. And it is wildly entertaining. So, you know, people hopefully now are understanding. And, and over time, see, people who turned up half, it's like, it's like going to watch a movie at a cinema or in the United States, you call it a movie theater. You go to watch a movie and you turn up halfway through the movie. You're not going to understand what's going on. You might get it twisted and think a certain character is one way when he's actually not because you haven't seen his entire character arc in context from the very beginning. And that's how it is with me. People turn up halfway through this AJ Wilder beef and they see the stuff I'm saying in the videos I'm making and they think, oh, well, he's just an AJ fan. They got it twisted. They don't realize I've been doing this since 2010, long before there was any AJ. And my history is to be objective. That's my history. To give credit where it's due. That's all. It's not about jumping on the bandwagon of one fighter and riding that bandwagon off into the sunset. No, that's never been what I'm about. <laughs> that's never been what I'm about. And anybody who's been subscribed to me for long enough will tell you that. And those who are kind of shocked to see me now saying that AJ should step away from the Ruiz rematch and let Ruiz go unify with Wilder, they're shocked about that. Oh my God, Hatman, you've lost your way. No, I haven't lost my way. You've lost your way. Because you had it twisted in the beginning and didn't understand what I was all about. Yeah? It was your misconception. Anybody who has been subscribed to me for longer than that, they'll know that this is what Hatman does. <laughs> it's not about jumping on a bandwagon and riding it off into the sunset. It's not what he's about. Yeah? I've got respect for all these warriors who get in the ring. But as a paying customer, I want to be entertained. Whoever's entertaining me the most, whoever is stepping up to the mark and taking on the best opposition when they're world champions, you know, or, or when it's appropriate, they're going to get praise from me. You know, if you look at the career of Anthony Yard, now he's stepping up apparently to fight Sergei Kovalev. Prior to that, he was fighting a terrible level of opposition. Um, I, you know, I, I, I coined the term, wake me up when we get there. Well, I didn't coin that term, but as it relates to Anthony Yard, I was the one who started using that term, wake me up when we get there. Because he wasn't doing anything of any consequence as far as I'm concerned by way of the opponents he's been putting it, been put in with. But now that he's fighting Kovalev, okay, I'm awake. Now I'm watching. <laughs> it's nothing against Anthony Yard. Nothing personal. I just want to be entertained. 
And I don't find somebody bashing up a bunch of hapless journeymen time and time and time again. I don't find that so entertaining. <laughs> you know? uh, at the same time, stepping up against Sergei Kovalev, is it a genius move by Tundi Ajaye? Have they read the situation perfectly? Or is it a hasty decision? I guess we'll find out if and when the fight takes place. But yeah, anyway. I'll end this video right here. I think I've made all the points I wanted to make. And uh, yeah, that's what it's about, man. Pride comes before a fall. What is your motivation for wanting to see Anthony Joshua get straight back in against Andy Ruiz? It's your pride. Be real. <laughs> that's what it's about. Yeah, it's not about you caring about AJ. AJ's got plenty of money. In fact, AJ might be taking this immediate rematch because of pride. Yeah, I've seen several boxing people from Barry Jones to uh, David Price to many others saying it's AJ's pride, you know, and it may be pressure from Matchroom and Sky and DAZN too. Because they don't want him to be out of title contention for a year, 18 months, two years. They don't want to see that. They, need, they want to see the money continue to roll in from big pay-per-views. Yeah? To me, I don't give a damn about, you know, Sky and the Zone and all them entities, Matchroom. I don't give a damn about them. They ain't going to go under. <laughs> They're all rich. They've all got plenty of money, right? The guy who owns the company that owns the Zone, um, Blavatnik, he's like a billionaire. <laughs> so if the zone fails, well, he's not going to lose any sleep. Now I'd like the zone to succeed for the fans and for the fighters. But as far as the, the business people behind these entities, man, they are the people that I least need to worry about. <laughs> if their ventures fail, they ain't going to lose no sleep. So I sure ain't going to lose no sleep. Sky are a very powerful, rich entity. Matchroom have made plenty of money. Even outside of boxing, they made loads of money. Eddie Hearn was raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. I ain't worried about him. <laughs> I'm just concerned about what's best for the fighters and what's best for me by way of entertainment. And so that's why I want to see fighters fulfill their physical potential. Because they're going to be then more entertaining to me if they've fulfilled their physical potential, if they've become the best version of themselves as fighters. That entertains me. I like to see that. You know, when they're just firing all cylinders and they've got all boxes ticked, not like any fighter is going to be perfect. Of course not. But when they're as good as they can possibly be, when I look at them and say, okay, well, for the tools that he has, this is as good as he could possibly be. For his athletic ability, this is as good as he's going to get. Once the fighter is at that level, I'm happy. You know? Anyway, drop your comments in the comment section below. Let me know how you feel about all the points I've raised in this video. It's happening, I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week, covering a wide variety of controversial topics, as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.